Every crisis you have seen over the last 20 to 25 years or 30 years even hasn't really been driven by high levels of government debt. Private sector debt is the real vulnerability. People often are preoccupied by governments defaulting. Instead, the private sector debt is what makes an economy very fragile. People are waiting for this recession. We are now approaching the last six to nine months, basically, of the macro lags, where you have checked all the boxes so far, and it's actually more likely that some recessionary vibes might pop up as well in the United States. Funnily enough, this is happening right at the moment when all the economists in the world are convinced that a soft landing is a done deal. There is no discussion anymore. Exactly like in October 2007, three months before the start of the worst recession since the Second World War, economists and the Federal Reserve were telling us everything was going to be smooth, a perfect soft landing. In 2007, the macro lags were as long as 25 months. At interest rates above 5%, this recession was never happening clearly by 2007. They thought that this time is different. This is exactly the same script. Tightening, the yield curve inverts, time lags, which are variable depending on the structure of the economy and the structure of private debt, and then finally a recession. Welcome to the Microscopic Podcast presented by Gold Republic. My name is Alex Adronov and in this format I invite you to look at the world through different lenses to see what's hidden in plain sight. We'll dive deep to understand the forces that drive macroeconomics, financial markets and the emergence of a new monetary system with some money like gold, silver and digital assets like Bitcoin. We'll also investigate how geopolitics and power games shape the world we live in. But also, what can we learn from history to understand the present and prepare for the future? I hope you will get fresh insight and enjoy this conversation. If you do, as always, please give it a like and subscribe, but also leave your actions down below in the comment section and share it to those who need to hear this. But before I start, I'd like you to know that if you open an account at Gold Republic, you will receive one free gram of gold worth 60 euros or $50. Just click on the link in the description. Welcome to the Macroscopic Podcast, uh, Alf. It's good to see you again. Hey, Alex. It's a pleasure to see you. Last time was two years ago. Yeah. I can't believe that. Yeah, time flies. Actually, my first question is always, I always hit it up the same way, is what is your most heretical view of the monetary system? <laughs> okay, let me do that. Central banks do not print inflationary forms of money. They print a form of money which is called bank reserves, and those bank reserves, you have to think of them as money for banks. Those are financial form of money. You and I cannot use bank reserves. And do you know who prints money that you and I can use? And therefore the money that produces inflation? That's the government when they make a lot of deficits, like they have done in 2020, 2021. And we have seen the inflation coming indeed in 2022. Or banks. When banks lend aggressively to the real economy, they create credit, they create more aggregate demand, more purchasing power, and that, if not balanced by enough supply, also creates bottlenecks which result in inflation. So commercial banks and governments print spendable money for us. Central banks, they print a financial form of money which remains in the financial system. That's the most erratic view, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think it's good that you actually even... Um, that you actually start with this because a lot of what you just said is going to be useful for what's going to come next. Uh, you are known for a lot of your insights, especially about the bond market. I mean, you have a really broad view about what's happening in uh, macroeconomics in general and monetary system, but you also come from that uh, background. You've been busy with um, following and, and trading and managing bonds for over, I think, almost two decades, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
So a lot of the things that we're going to talk today is about what is the bond market telling us? Um, are we expecting a recession next year? Um, uh, we're going to talk about yield curve inversions. We're going to talk about all those kind of things that the bond market can tell us. And I've, I've heard many times, and, and you probably as well, and you've kept on repeating it, but the you, you cannot... Uh, you cannot go against the bond market. The bond market is kind of like the most reliable source of truth that is in the monetary system. And maybe that sounds candid to us, but why is that so? Yeah. So basically, you have to think uh, of the bond market as the foundation layer of financial markets all the biggest institutions in the world, and now you're going to be thinking about the Federal Reserve, but you should instead be thinking about monetary authorities around the world that accumulate dollars because their own countries and companies, they sell, for example, commodities or products. Those products are sold in dollars. These dollars enter the domestic economies, China, Brazil, for example. And what happens is that these countries need to recycle and invest these hard-earned dollars in some assets. They're not going to be buying stocks. They want something safe, liquid, with a deep repo market, and that's the treasury market. So again, bonds. You should think about pension funds and insurance companies. The aggregate market cap of these companies is over $40 trillion in assets under management. Those are gigantic whales. Those are, for instance, pension funds. Those are companies that need to pay future pensions. So that means that they need to hit a certain return target to make the system sustainable overall, but also they need to balance out their long duration liabilities, the future pensions they need to pay with long duration assets. Guess what? That's bonds again. Banks buy bonds as well for many reasons, some regulatory, some opportunistic. What I'm saying is the bond market is gigantic and it's the foundation of financial markets overall it's the foundational layer that stands there and supports the credit market so the corporate bond market for example and then above that the stock market but also gold and commodities and other assets they are all somehow related to the bond market and that's why i think it is really important that people master it it's very scary though it's full of jargon, technicalities. It seems extremely complicated. So my job here is not to sound smart and make it more complicated, but vice versa, to try and make it understandable for people. Mm. And what are the, let's say, most important nuances you would say you would reckon are really important to understand? Because um, you have also like developed a course about the bond market, and we might talk about this later on. Um, but just for someone who really is looking at uh, bonds in general, what are the key elements that they should understand about how it works, the different type of bonds, and how they basically are shaping the dynamics in, in the economy uh, nowadays? So look, if you want to, st let's start from the clearest um, type of bond out there, which is government bonds. When I say clearest, I mean that they have only interest rate risk, but they also don't carry credit risk because the bond market is a mix really of interest rate risk, also known as duration risk, and potentially also credit risk. So if the bond is issued by me or a corporate, then there is also a credit aspect to it. If the corporate defaults or I cannot repay basically your bond, then you are running credit risk on that company or on a person or on an, on an individual in the private sector. But instead, government bonds don't necessarily have that credit angle. They mostly have an interest rate risk angle. Okay, So this is valid especially if governments issue in their own currency. Most of the government defaults we have seen over the last 100 years are due to two main phenomena. One is governments issued in a foreign currency. So they issued bonds, not in their domestic currency, but in a foreign currency. That's clearly a bottleneck at some point, because if you can't get your hands on this foreign currency, say you are Argentina and you issue bonds in dollar, if you can't get your hands organically on dollar flows, how are you gonna repay these dollar bonds that you issued, right? That's an obvious bottleneck, which can cause a lot of problems because Argentina cannot produce dollars. So for example, now in the case of, like, let's put it back to actuality, sorry to interrupt, uh, with Millet being elected president of Argentina and he's just worth through the dollarization and wants to get rid of the Argentine pesos and the central bank. Um, 
how do you apply that then uh, to that uh, specific case? Well, it's a bit complicated because Argentina doesn't really have much net dollars left in their economy. So basically, the a country can have dollar debt, and a country can also have dollar assets against it, right? And the most wealthy foreign countries outside the United States are countries that have a positive balance between their dollar assets and their dollar liabilities. Argentina is not a good example of that, unfortunately. But China, for example, which is always pinpointed as an extremely fragile economy in China, it's true, they have a lot of debt that they've accumulated over the past decades in dollars, but they've also accumulated a ton of assets in dollars. Both the one they declare, so they own over a trillion dollar of treasury bonds, those are assets in dollars, but they've also invested in foreign infrastructure abroad, so they have a lot of assets against those liabilities. Now, when you are a government and you issue in foreign currency, you need to make sure that you have either enough foreign assets denominated in that currency or that you can get your hands on regularly on a flow of dollars, for example, which you can use indeed to service and repay your dollar debt. But if you're issuing in your own currency, the story is different because you as the government, you have the ability to produce the, the currency. You are the issuer of the very currency. You are the institution that guarantees the legal tender of that currency. Now, in a nominal sense, that means you cannot default because you can issue more debt, you can have more deficits, and in principle, to repay that hole, to fill that hole, you can issue more debt and you can make more deficit. It's you that decide how much currency you can issue bottleneck with that, and I know what you're thinking, if you do this in an uncontrolled way, if you do this too much, if the deficit that you are injecting into the real economy goes to unproductive purposes, you will generate inflation. And inflation is the real bottleneck, which doesn't necessarily make a government default nominally, but it can make it default in real terms. So what it means is that your money gets devalued. So. You don't default by owning bonds, but slowly but surely you get a negative real interest rate. Mm -hmm. So the coupons you make, 3 or 4% are dwarfed by the inflation rate which is generated by excessive fiscal spending and excessive deficits. But remember, it's only the excesses that will generate this. A country can go on for a lot of time issuing that in their own currency and putting it to somehow a productive use without having this inflation problem. See Japan. Japan has been doing this for now three decades, Alexei. They have been mm. issuing a lot of that denominated in Japanese yen. This is important. And Japan has a big buffer of foreign assets as well. So Japan is in a position in which people are afraid that they will default, but they don't because they have a lot of foreign assets against their foreign liabilities and they're issuing bonds in their domestic currency in a relatively predictable fashion. They're doing a bit of deficit year after year, but they are not exploding it higher like the US did in 2020, 2021. And that indeed ended up generating inflation. If you do that year after year after year after year, then you become Argentina. But really those are relatively rare cases. And the reason why government bonds are mostly an interest rate risk instrument rather than a credit instrument. Mm -hmm. People often are preoccupied by governments defaulting. Instead, the private sector debt is what is really makes an economy very fragile. If an economy is highly leveraged in its households and its corporates, that's a problem, Alexei, because if I have $1 of income, and I make $3 of that, $4 of that, or $5 of that, the moment interest rates go higher, and I need to allocate more of that dollar to service my debt, I cannot print new dollars mm -hmm. as a household or as a corporate. I literally need more earnings, more salaries, more cash flows, if I want to maintain a, a healthy proportion of spending. Most likely, I cannot do that. It means my salaries my salary remains stable, my cash flows as a company are more or less predictable. If interest rates go up on my large pile of private sector debt, I will be forced to allocate more of my dollar to debt servicing rather than to hiring people, spending money. And that means the economy goes into recession pretty quickly and things become unstable when the private sector is more preoccupied on servicing their own debt rather than spending money in the economy. 
every crisis you have seen over the last 20 to 25 years or 30 years even hasn't really been driven by high levels of government debt. But I can walk you through the Japanese crisis of the 90s. What happened there? Was it government debt? No, it was the real estate bubble. Japanese households had become leveraged 250% uh, private debt to GDP. And as the Bank of Japan was trying to cool off the real estate bubble, raising interest rates, just at the moment when the Imperial Palace of Tokyo was valued more than the entire state of California, this is the level we reached, when they raised the interest rates, the whole thing became unsustainable for the Japanese private sector and the bubble burst. You can go to the Asian tiger crisis of the 90s, Thailand, Malaysia, etc. Same story, private debt, 200% of GDP. Spain joined Europe uh, when the Maastricht Treaty were made, and they told Spain, you can't make a deficit higher than 3% of GDP on a government perspective. And so Spain said, you know what, instead of levering up my government balance sheet, I will lever up my private balance sheet. And they made credit ample and cheap for households. The Spanish real estate market also went in a bubble. What happened in 2012, 2013? Eurozone debt crisis. The US in 2007, same story. So private sector debt is the real vulnerability rather than government. It's, it's more complicated for governments to default, let's say, or the conditions to be in place for governments to default Instead, have a look at the private sector. It's much more vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And now if we just take that and we look at, for example, uh, the state of the, the, the percentage of private debt to GDP worldwide, which are, let's say, the five countries or regions where you're the most concerned at the moment? So this is a good question because now I'm going to raise some eyebrows in our audience. And I'm going to say, think with me of all countries you can imagine in the world that are rated AAA, so they are supposed to be the safest. And I will tell them there is a high chance each and every one of them has a very high level of private sector debt. So Australia, check. Private sector debt is, I think, 200% of GDP over there. Um, China, very high private sector debt as well, although the government really isn't indebted, the private sector is, is very leveraged. Switzerland, private sector debt to GDP, 240%. The Netherlands private sector debt to GDP over 200%. Um, Sweden, private sector debt over 200%. Canada, private sector debt over 200% of GDP. All these countries, all of them are rated AAA because their government debt to GDP is very low. So on the government side, they aren't doing fiscal deficits. They're being very conservative. They are not injecting money in the, in the private sector. They have high tax rates and so on and so forth. And so what? The private sector is saying, well, if you government do, are not lose enough in your fiscal policy with us, the private sector, so you don't cut our taxes, you don't inject investments into the economy, well, we will need to lever up ourselves. And so the private sector in these countries is very indebted. Generally speaking, that tends to work until as long as interest rates are lower and lower and lower. So think of uh, certain European countries, for example. Europe is a good example of that, right? So as long as um, interest rates in Europe were negative and mortgage rates were below 2% and corporate borrowing rates were at 2%, the private sector could lever up. French corporates, extremely levered up. The Dutch private sector, very levered up. But then what happens is at some point, these interest rates go up. And as interest rates go up, slowly but surely, a bigger and bigger proportion of the households and the corporates will face a problem. The problem is, hey, my old mortgage, my old corporate loan is maturing. I need to roll it. They go and check the, the borrowing rates and it's not 2% anymore, it's five or six. Has their salary gone up or their cash flows gone up by 30 or 40% to offset that? Probably not, Alex says. So they will face a situation where they have a similar pie of income to allocate, but all of a sudden they realize their debt costs way more than they thought it would cost forever. And so when they go and refinance and the larger share of the private sector goes through this refinancing process, it's bad news. And the only thing you can do is cut spending, try to shed labor. So countries that have raised interest rates really aggressively following the Federal Reserve, and that's Canada, Europe, the UK, Sweden, New Zealand, all these countries that have 
fragilities from the private sector perspective, they now face a problem and we are seeing it happen under our, our very eyes. The Eurozone is effectively stagnating for a year. Real GDP growth is zero at best, and in some countries you're already falling into a recession as we speak. UK, zero real growth, with the recession looming there as well. New Zealand, pretty much in a recession. Canada, a fourth quarter, a third quarter GDP negative, so they're going there. Sweden, already pretty much in a recession. So what I'm saying is all central banks have tried to raise interest rates to fight inflation. That's been also reflected in bond markets. Bond markets have therefore made borrowing more expensive for the private sector. Mortgage rates are higher, corporate borrowing rates are higher, but not every country is in a position to sustain these higher interest rates and not because of the headlines you often read, the US is going broke, uh, blah, blah, blah. It's not a government problem first, at least at first, it's a private sector problem. Mm. That's where you should pay the most attention to. That's a good point, I think, because a lot of people, especially in the past months, when we talk about also like the interest uh, rate payment from uh, from the US government and so on, the fact that they've been also downgraded for the debt and so on and so forth, is kind of like, especially if we look at the grand scheme of things, the, the dollar or the US will always be the least hurt in this kind of setup anyways. That, and, is, that is so true, I'd yeah. say, in a system where we have leveraged the entire world around the dollar. And this is called the Euro dollar system. So the Euro dollar system is effectively a system where even if you are not a dollar entity, so you do not reside physically in the United States, you can lever up and you can borrow in dollars. Fantastic. So if we are going to pay all our commodities in dollars, all our foreign invoices is going to be done in dollars, all our services abroad are going to be sold in dollars, it's great. I can lever up my balance sheet as a corporate. I can have more debt in dollars. I can finance more spending in dollars. Everything works amazing as long as dollars are freely flowing around the world, right? So I am a Brazilian corporate. I sell soybeans, okay, in dollars to other companies around the world and other countries. And I can lever up and I can borrow in dollars, even though, remember, I can't print dollars. My central bank cannot print dollars. Eh? I'm in Brazil, not in the United States. But I can lever up and borrow dollars and everything is fine as long as I'm selling soybeans. So more dollars are coming through my door and I can use them to service my dollar debt. We have levered up a system around the dollar. There are 12 trillion, not billion, trillion dollars of debt issued by companies and entities that are not in the United States. So the moment that you make this dollar flows tighter, maybe because the economy is slowing down, so you are not really selling so many soybeans anymore, or maybe the Federal Reserve is making dollar borrowing very expensive by raising interest rates, it's not the United States that gets it the most. They also do get hit, their private sector mostly gets a hit, Think about everybody else in the world. These guys don't even have access directly to the dollar. And now their dollar borrowing is getting more expensive at a time where the economy is slowing. So the organic flow of dollars is also, is also slowing. And so you deflate a system that has been leveraged and inflated around the role of the dollar that hurts more foreign countries than it hurts the US itself. And this is a concept that people have a little bit of a hard time to understand, but it is important because to destroy the, or to change and modify the paradigm of this dollar system, you need to break it from within and break the system from within, funnily enough, will hurt more outside countries at first than it will hurt the United States itself. I think it's also uh, is important to see of, of the interplay of inflation and uh, bonds. And I know you've explained this um, quite a lot also in your regular newsletter. And a lot of what basically uh, constitutes price of bonds is tied to future expectations of economic growth, but also inflation. Yes. Um, and thereby, since we're also in a bit of a weird time where inflation is sticky and it's important maybe to dissociate the different types of inflation, um, how does that play? How does that come into, into play? So look, bond markets are uh, to be segmented. So you have the short part of the bond market and the longer end of the curve. So if you think about the bond yield curve, you have anything between two years and five years, that is the shorter end of the curve, and especially the 10 year plus, that is the longer end of the curve. Those are driven by different factors. Even when you think about growth and inflation, 
you can think about them in a separate way. And let's start from the front end, two to five year bonds. So two to five year bonds will mostly reflect what the central bank will be doing over the next two to five years. All central banks around the world, I'll say have pretty much a dual mandate, either explicit or implicit. The Fed has an explicit dual mandate. They say, literally, they are targeting the labor market, so good, solid labor market, and inflation around 2%. The central bank only has an explicit inflation target, but an implicit growth target. In other words, they always try to balance growth and inflation. They want predictable inflation around 2% and the economy to grow organically well. That means that the front end of the curve will be reflecting again what the central bank does for the next two to five years, and what they do will depend on growth and inflation. So if inflation is very high right now, the central banks and above their target, the central banks will feel compelled to raise interest rates to bring back inflation to their target. Because being credible as a central bank is the most important thing. They want to be credible in their ability to bring inflation down to 2%. So if inflation is one or three, eh, that's okay. But as soon as you get way above these bands, both on a deflation or excessive inflation, you will see them react very aggressively. That's what we have seen in 2022. When they do that, the front end of the bond market will have to react as well because two to five year bonds, they basically reflect the central bank stance for the next two to five years. And that's what we have seen. Front end bond yields have gone up very rapidly. But we have also seen that the curves have inverted. So the yield curve has become inverted. In other words, the interest rates have gone up so rapidly at the two and the five year points, but not so rapidly at the 10 or the 30 year point to the point where the curve became pretty much inverted. And it has been inverted now for 17 months and counting in the United States. What does that mean? The 10 year to the 30 year part of the bond market thinks much more in medium term than only cares about what the central bank does. And what really influences long end bond yields is expectations about future growth for the next 10 years, the next 30 years, and expectations about future inflation for the next 10 year and 30 years. So the bond market is generally relatively smart about it and they think, well, now the European Central Bank has hiked the interest rates to 4%. Wow, that is pretty much unprecedented. We have last seen something like that 25 years ago. So is the economy able to handle 4% interest rates? Well, it's gonna be hard, you know, all these leveraged corporates, all these leveraged households, can the housing market work so good with mortgage rates at 5%? Probably not as good. And so what the market does is they say, yes, for the first two or five years, you will keep interest rates very elevated, but you will make a damage to future growth and future inflation. In other words, we are gonna lower our expectations for future growth and future inflation because of the damage that you will be doing to the economy by raising interest rates for the next one or two years. And so it ends up being that long and interest rates are more of a reflection of what happens after year two, year three, year four, and year five. And as people become more pessimistic on growth and inflation, long and interest rates have a harder time going up as fast as the front end. And so the curve inverts. That is also a signal from the bond market, indeed, that they expect damage to be done to growth and inflation down the road. This is one of the reasons why a yield curve tends to be a good indicator of an upcoming recession or not. When it's inverted, people tend to say, okay, I see that the bond market is telling me that this is gonna generate damage down the road. And inversions tend to predict recessions, but there are some steps in the meantime. The typical mistake people do is the yield curve inverts and they say a recession is coming now. But the reality is a bit different. It takes some time between the initial yield curve inversion to feed into enough economic weakness to ultimately lead us into a recession. And this time lag is variable. It's anywhere between 10 months and 27 months. So it can be, there can be a year and a half of time lag, of variability in this time lag, and more than two years actually from the initial curve inversion to the recession itself. So these are the mechanics, the yield curve inverts, the Federal Reserve or the ECB are hiking rates aggressively and the bond market says, well done guys, but I'm gonna say that growth and inflation are gonna be slower. 
there is then a period, the so-called macro lag, anywhere between 10 and 27 months. And in this period, what will happen is that the private sector will start feeling the heat. The variability depends on how much refinancing has to really be done soon. How much, what is the portion of your liabilities, of your borrowing as a private sector, which is variable. If you have a lot of variable rate mortgages, a lot of variable rate loans, the pain is immediate. The central bank is raising rates and you feel it immediately in your bills at the end of the month. So you will be spending less. And so the recession comes earlier. You are closer to the 10 months in the macro lags rather than the 27 months of the macro lags. If you have a lot of refinancing to be done, that's another indicator that you will be closer to the 10 part because a lot of debt is coming due, which means you have to refinance this debt. And as you do, as we explained before, you'll face a higher bill, you will be spending less, you will be falling into a recession. But it's, it can also be 27 months because as per the United States, they don't have a lot of variable rate mortgages. They don't have a lot of variable rate loans. That means the pain isn't felt immediately. It takes a while until mm. you reset these mortgages. Also in 2019 and 2020 and 2021, mortgages were locked in for 30 years. Corporate borrowing was locked in for 10 years plus, which means the refinancing are coming, but very slowly. So that means it takes longer for the yield curve inversion to feed into economic weakness, which is aligning to a recession, which means you might be closer to the 27 months than you are to the 10 months. So remember, tightening, the yield curve inverts, time lags, which are variable depending on the structure of the economy and the structure of private debt, and then finally a recession. This is the sequence that moves the yield curve inversion to feed into economic weakness, which is consistent with the recession. Mm. And I think you also uh, brought up like, um, uh, I mean, you've actually talked about this in, in your latest uh, newsletter, but you've also talked about uh, other actually more, um, yeah, I would say detailed uh, aspects of that. And it's about bull and bear steepening in the mm. bond market and how that those trends actually currently manifest. And I, I understood the bull steepening actually occurs when the economy breaks due to like very tight policies, while the bear steepening happens when the economy actually withstands those higher rates with the longer, higher for longer in terms of long-term yields and potentially then leading afterwards into economic distress. Um, how, how do you see those trends now manifest and how did they manifest in the past? Could you maybe uh, give so, us a bit of an overview? So this is really the last step. So you have yield curve inversion, macro lags, 10 to 27 months. We are now at month 17 in the United States to give you some reference. Steepening of the curve just before a recession kicks in. Well, today we have basically gone all through all these steps so far, yield curve inversion, month number 17, steepening. We have had a couple of flavors, but I would say the, the strongest one was the summer bear steepening. So the August, September, October bear steepening. So what is that? Sounds very complicated, but it's really easy. So the cur curve is inverted, right? And it has remained inverted throughout the steepening as well, but the curve starts from very, very inverted levels. The two year to 10 year spread was negative 100 basis points at some point. And then people are waiting for this recession, Alexei. And you know, they are convinced the macro lags are very short, maybe 10 to 12 months, but this recession doesn't happen because as we explained, the private sector in the US is somehow more immune or the macro lags will be longer this time, in other words, than people thought. But people have put on trades for this recession. They're waiting and they're waiting and they're waiting and it never happens. So at some point they throw in the towel. And as in every cycle with longer macro lags, the last example is 2007, 2008, people start thinking, okay, this time is different. <laughs> this time the yield curve inversion will not cause a recession because it's not happening. I've been waiting for 12 months, man, and it doesn't happen. So this time is different. And there is always a rational that we attach to that. Why is that? Well, in 2007, all this private sector debt and all this inversion didn't matter because the housing market in the US was unstoppable. There was no way it could go down. This time is different. We have figured it out. Now it's, you know, the narrative has been different. This time is different because of artificial intelligence. Let's say productivity boom, that's gonna change the world like the internet did. And so the economy is gonna be so much more productive that interest rates can be at 5% permanently, no damage is gonna get done. This was one of the narratives. 
that was going on in summer, there were many others why this time is different. The reality is that the macro legs are longer. That's what it is. But as people throw in the towel, what happens is that central banks start to get also convinced that this time is different. They come to the wires and they say, it's higher for longer. We think that equilibrium rates in the economy have gone up. They basically propel this narrative further. And at that point, the bond market says, okay, I hear you. I'm going to take a very inverted yield curve. And because you say the economy can handle higher interest rates, let's test it. Let's give it a test. So what they will do is they will take interest rates and at the front end, move them a little bit higher, maybe put in another interest rate hike by the Federal Reserve, but it's the long end that will move higher and higher and higher and higher and higher. So in other words, the curve steepens, it becomes less mm -hmm. inverted, and it's driven by the long end of the bond market. That's where yields go up rapidly. So, so basically overall, if you look at uh, over time, I think there was a very good like fast forward thing by Eagly, I think that showed like how basically that, that yield curve overall actually, just like the sea level rises, yeah. the same happens then with those levels of the, of the yield curve. Okay. It still remained inverted throughout the period, but the flatness of the curve was was cancelled by this rapid steepening and the steepening was led by the long end. So it's here where the sea level goes up, up and up very rapidly. And we saw third year bond yields in October reaching levels above 5%. So the bear steepening led long end interest rates to move up rapidly. Okay, what happens then? We have seen this happening in the 80s last time. It's not a very uh, recurring phenomenon that you have an inverted curve and then a rapid bear steepening that precedes a recession. When you have that rapid bear steepening, what you end up doing is you make damage to highly leveraged business models. Real estate, shadow banking, credit markets, highly uh, valued companies. And we saw the Nasdaq taking a plunge, for example, and unprofitable tech this kind of sectors taking a plunge and mortgage rates going to 8%. And we saw this happening basically. So effectively you apply more pressure and you really damage these highly leveraged business models. And when that happens, generally you'll see some serious cracks appearing in market somewhere. It's not an immediate thing. Maybe you'll see the bodies popping up in three to four months, but that kind of vicious move in the long end of bond markets make some serious damage somewhere in highly leveraged zombie businesses, which we have fostered and created during the zero interest rate environment. Okay, so we have seen that happening. And I think that that is one additional signal as we have inverted the curve, the curve has been inverted for 17 months. We have had bear steepening. We have had also some flavors of bull steepening in the meantime, signaling that the labor market is weakening, that the tightening is working. We are now approaching the last six to nine months, basically, of the macro lags, where you have checked all the boxes so far, and it's actually more likely that some recessionary vibes might pop up as well in the United States. Funnily enough, this is happening right at the moment when all the economists in the world are convinced that the soft landing is the only way out, that the soft landing is a done deal. There is no discussion anymore. Exactly like in October 2007, the Federal Reserve issued a uh, summary of economic projections that said, we have tightened interest rates. Yeah, the housing market is weakening a bit. That's October 2007, guys. Eh? So three months before the start of the worst recession since the Second World War, three months before, economists and the Federal Reserve were telling us that, yeah, the economy was going to slow and GDP growth was going to be 1.5% to 2% in 2008. Everything was going to be smooth a perfect soft landing. In 2007, the macro lags were as long as 25 months. So the Fed had hiked rates a lot, 2005, 2006. They took a long pause at interest rates above 5%. This recession was never happening, Alexei. So clearly by 2007, they thought that this time is different. This is exactly the same script, pretty much exactly the same that we are following this time. And it's interesting that human nature is to be very impatient. If a recession hasn't happened 12 months, 15 months after yield curve inversion, then it's never going to happen. So I think investors can now think in more uh, deviation from expectations uh, terms. So if you have a framework for investing, 
you shouldn't think that you are investing um, with a white canvas in front of you. Like I see people waking up and they say, I like um, this stock, I like this bond market, I like this and I like that. That's fair enough, everybody has its own preferences, but you should ask yourself, what is priced in in these assets? Because there is an entire ecosystem, which is called financial markets, which is attaching a certain expectations for an economic output to a certain asset. So ask yourself, what is priced in today? What is the consensus today that I'm investing against? And the consensus is that we are going to get a soft landing. It's an 80% down deal. It's basically the only game in town. Instead, if you follow this script and you follow history, over the next six to nine months, it's more likely that it maybe doesn't turn that way. And if it doesn't, you need to think by yourself, how do I protect, how do I skew my portfolio so that my result is, you know, more sheltered uh, in case I don't get a soft landing because everybody seems to be betting on it. Mm. It's funny because um, at the beginning of this year, we had the most anticipated recession and now we have the most anticipated maybe soft landing. Yeah. In both cases, I mean, we've clearly seen that um, assets have been appreciated, uh, have ap appreciating since actually January. So the ones that have not been calling for a recession have been pocketing like some good profits. I mean, if you look at stocks, True. if you look at even crypto now, uh, it's been all increasing about 50%. Alexei, an amazing example of the fact that we invest against expectations, against consensus. In January, 45% of economists, basically half of them, were expecting a recession to hit by the first half of 2023. So it was an imminent prediction, an imminent base case. The average economist was expecting that the US would have not created jobs, but lost jobs by April, January to April. That's only three months, four months. So basically a recession is coming and it's a base case. That also obviously gets baked in in prices. So if you have a view that Maybe you're not going to get a booming economy, but that you're not going to get a recession yet in 2023. As you can see, you can make a lot of money from it, mm. like uh, crypto assets or even uh, stocks that were particularly hammered down because of these expectations of a recession, like uh, European stocks. I liked Poland this year, for example, a great mm. growth story. The Polish market is up 40% this year, 4-0 in a single year. So by simply deviating from consensus, that doesn't mean you have to be a contrarian all the time, okay? But if you have an expectation which diverges from uh, the base case, which everybody else in the market, that consensus is applying, that's generally enough to put yourself in a position to pocket from this divergence effectively uh, playing out. Mm -hmm. Coming back to the uh, yield curve inversion, I think you also mentioned something about credit spreads, which I thought was pretty interesting because I see this popping up as well on, on Fintwit quite a lot as well. People just like giving all those um, alerts and warnings is that uh, from what I understood, credit spreads are only uh, interesting for now this particular scenario when it happens. They have been basically yeah. foretelling uh, for, for example, bull steepening. So that was the, yeah. the case, for example, in uh, the, the great financial crisis where the great spreads was basically a few months before uh, it basically, uh, the debacle started. And now if I look at the 1790s scenario and all the other thing that you mentioned, it's basically once the credit spreads starts being really worrying, uh, it actually is too late already. Yeah, that's true. So you have to think of credit. First of all, let's define what they are. Yeah. So credit spreads are the additional cost that corporates need to pay to borrow on top of what the treasury yield is. Okay. So government bonds have a certain yield. Corporates aren't the government. So they need to pay an additional spread. That's the credit spread to effectively borrow. Okay, good. So credit spreads are always seen as a good indicator of how the economy is doing, okay? And people say, if credit spreads are very tight, things are great. If credit spreads are ballooning, something is wrong. And they want to look at credit spreads as a predictive uh, item. But the reality is that, as I show in some of my work, uh, credit spreads are a coincident indicator of how, not, not a leading indicator, a coincident indicator. So if the people realize that the economy is going badly, then they are going to demand a higher premium to buy corporate bonds because they also will think, well, there's a higher chance that corporates default, so I want to be paid for that, um, that risk I'm taking. But it's something that happens 
coincidentally. So the economy weakens, people realize it, the labor market is losing jobs, credit spreads will widen. There is no foretelling ability, let's say, uh, in, in credit spreads. And that's one of the things about bond markets. Once you start to master them, all these narratives and noise that you read everywhere, you'll be able to cut through the noise and understand, okay, the, the front end of the yield curve is driven by these factors. The long end of the yield curve is driven by these other factors. And who are the players? Pension funds and banks, and what are their incentive schemes? And you'll be thinking, okay, QE is going on. What is QE? Because I hear that it's printing money. Okay, What's, what happens? Ask yourself literally, and this is also what I go through in, in my courses, just make by yourself the T accounts and say, the central bank is doing this, it's buying this from this other actor. You can just follow the money basically step by step and really get a practical understanding of what goes on with QE, QT, the front end of the curve, yield curve inversions, credit spreads. So you really master this complicated market cutting through the noise because there is so much good material online these days. The problem is that there is a ton of noise as well with it. And, and people, I think, are scared of bond markets because it's full of all these technicalities we are discussing. They don't find people that take their time to explain these dynamics. They only find people who want to sound smart to get an audience and throw in difficult jargon. And then they, it becomes more of a, an emotional game. You know, you get attached to a certain narrative and you like how this guy says things, but instead you should take a step back and really approach it as a thing to understand. And it's, it's not that complicated really, as long as you uh, try find somebody who spends time to explain the concepts rather than sound smart about them. Yeah. And that's what I love about you. <laughs> um, in that sense, like if we now apply like all the things that we've just talked about, uh, if we look forward now for the next, because we're talking about the macro lag, we're, uh, as you said, we're 17 months in and it can kick into uh, at least if we look back at the uh, great financial crisis up to 26 months, mm -hmm. 27, I forgot the exact month, uh, number of months, but um, what do you expect in the next uh, 10 months? So I would say that um, I think the soft lending pricing is now getting extended to Europe as well. That's wrong. I think Europe as the ECB has done way too much and uh, Europe is already paying the price for it. But I'm afraid that the ECB will not be proactive enough to cut interest rates. I think they will wait and wait and wait and the economy will get worse and worse and worse. So that's true for Europe, the UK and other jurisdictions around like Canada, for example, or Australia, they're all under pressure and they will continue to be that. So now that the market is assigning a soft lending pricing as well to European assets where equities are doing great and so on and so forth, I think it's good for people to reassess whether they want to take risks with this kind of soft lending pricing also in European assets. I think that's the first thing to do. Second, the US, which is really the elephant in the room, right? And I think there it's a bit of the same story, but people have to be a bit more patient because the US structure of private sector debt with long maturities, no variable interest rates means that the refinancing cycle is slow. It's now kicking in. We are again in the period next six to nine months can be more challenging for the United States as well. But six to nine months is still a relatively long period of time. Eh? Remember, people are impatient. So if you want to try and play defensive in the US as well, keep that in mind. Eh? It's easier to, I think, see the cracks popping up in Europe sooner than it is to see them mm -hmm. popping up in the US. If you are a long-term oriented investor, so your horizon is one, three, five years, then the story is a bit different because when everybody was losing their mind and yields were 5%, this is government bond deals, okay? You need to think for yourself, I, here I, I'm given a great opportunity to lock in a pretty decent return, 5% per year for the next 10 years. Sounds pretty good to me, to be honest, as a base return for your own savings. And I don't think this time is different. I don't think the economy can magically handle 5% interest rates. So when you're given the opportunity to actually take this uh, guaranteed rate of return, nominal rate of return for the next five years, 10 years, I think it's a good thing to do. Allocate a part of your savings to a stable, predictable source of income, government bonds. Still today in the US, you can get about four and a half percent. That's not too bad. Again, you need to be long-term oriented though, because if a recession doesn't happen, 
bonds are not necessarily going to perform in the next three to six months, but they can be a very good, reliable source of income for the next 10 years. And then you think a bit more diversified and you say, okay, I want to have some equities in my portfolio, but if I think, if I think things are getting worse, especially in Europe or in the UK, I don't want those. In the US, valuations are very high. So where else do I look at? There's a lot of emerging markets, I think, that are particularly cheap and you can have them for the long run. I made the example of Poland, for instance. Brazil, another great market to be invested in. So think globally rather than focus only on Europe or the US when it comes to your risk. Think about bonds as a guaranteed source of income, good return for the next five to 10 years with an optionality that can protect you against the recession as well. Because if we get one, interest rates are going pretty rapidly back. So bonds will be making a bit more money in that case. Think of gold as always as a strong allocation in your portfolio. I have my own uh, forever portfolios that allocate 8 to 10% of my wealth to gold as a baseline allocation, which can get as high as 15, 20% if I think there is a good cyclical opportunity for gold. So always have a, um, uh, a solid allocation to gold in your portfolio. And this way, you can maneuver around, I think, your allocations in a safe and prudent way. But my main message is, be careful about the soft lending pricing in general, and mm -hmm. particularly so be careful about it in Europe and in the UK, in Canada, in Australia, because those are economies that are much more fragile and therefore prone to an accident earlier than the United States, United States is. Mm -hmm. Something that we maybe uh, uh, forgot to also like um, um, dive into was maybe like the longer tail of the yield curve, which is mainly driven, as you also explained uh, uh, perfectly, by different factors, demographics, uh, inflation and growth expectation. Uh, and we, if we look at, let's say, just inflation for now, you predict that uh, inflation is going to be sticky, that it will not be back to the 2% that most central banks want it to be. Why is that? And, and, and where do you see it for now, the decade to come? So this is interesting because inflation can be split in cycles and structural inflation. So we have had a cycle now of inflation rising really rapidly to 7, 8%. And now the cycle is downwards. So inflation in Europe is already two and a half. That's pretty quick, right? And in the US, we're getting there. And I think that because the economies are going to weaken further, there is a chance that you actually get very quick to even below 2% in this cycle, okay? So there are cycles. You have gone up to seven, you'll go down to two or one. But what about the next decade when it comes to the baseline level of inflation? The baseline level of inflation over the last 10 years has been one and a half percent. Predictable, no variations, very easy to live with it and, and um, for a central banker and for markets to digest. I don't think the next decade is going to be anything like that, to be honest. And I think there are factors at play for which you can make an argument that the baseline of inflation is going to be higher than one and a half to two percent. But most importantly, that the volatility around this baseline is going to be really, really exaggerated. So we are used to have this inflation predictably around one and a half. And I think the baseline is not one and a half, it's maybe two and a half or three in the next decade. But most importantly, that you're going to have a lot of phases where inflation is five, and then it's one, and then it's six, and then it's zero. And all this volatility around inflation is going to make your portfolios look very vulnerable unless you have an asset allocation that also has assets that do well in deflationary and inflationary moments. Because when inflation picks up very rapidly, like in 2022, your bonds and your stocks are going to go down together. So you need something else in your portfolio. You need commodities, you need gold, you need some allocation that does well in that environment. Mm -hmm. When you get a deflation very rapidly, bonds are a key part of your portfolio because they're going to perform really, really well in that environment. So as you see, you need a mix of assets and this is paramount important for the next decade. People have become spoiled over the last 10 years to having a 60-40 portfolio, which is, to be honest, pretty much stocks, the volatility of a 60-40 portfolio, it's 85% correlated to the S&P 500. So 60-40 means pretty much the S&P 500, pretty much. And the S&P 500 means pretty much tech stocks. They represent a higher and higher proportion of that. And because they've been doing so well, people are now extrapolating that this will last forever. Mm. But as long as you get some volatility in inflation, maybe a bit higher of a baseline inflation level, all this plan will not work that well anymore. So I always encourage people to think of their portfolios in geographical diversification, 
do I have exposure to emerging markets that maybe benefit from inflation, for example? And also to think of them as to have a balanced asset allocation. Do I have commodities? Do I have gold? Do I have real assets in my portfolio? Do I have internationally diversified equities? Do I have emerging markets? You should think of your portfolios in broader terms than not simply sticking with the 60-40 just because it worked for the last 10 years. There were entire decades in the last century where the 60-40 portfolio delivered negative returns. And I'm talking not a year, a decade of negative returns. So think about it when looking at the next decade. I was wondering, um, if you look at gold now more precisely, real yields have been positive since now a few months, but gold has been rallying. Why is that and how do you explain this? Uh, I think this is another relationship that people got very accustomed to and therefore they say, oh, I got gold figured out. It's just real interest rates and that's it. But the reality is that again, if you extend your analysis further into the past, you see there are, that's, there are times where gold really deviates from anything, Alexei, literally. You cannot pinpoint it to bonds, to stocks, to real yields, to nothing. And those are periods where I think something structurally is happening that is um, not related to the behavior of other asset classes, okay? And I think this time the explanation is that <laughs> institutions around the world that accumulate excess and surplus of money. So this can be, you know, again, I, I made the example of Brazil selling soybeans before, right? They allocate, they get these dollars in, they will get also some euros, they will get a bunch of these currencies in, right? And then they have to invest these currencies. They have to invest this surplus, in other words, in financial assets. And they will do it mostly in bonds, okay? But we have had the situation with the US and Russia and sanctions on, uh, on foreign exchange reserves. And I think that has changed a little bit the paradigm that these assets are liquid and safe because as long as you're a friend of the United States, great. If you're not a friend of the United States or you plan to become a bit of an enemy, then you know your surplus of, of money just disappears, gets frozen. So that, that isn't great. And so I think some of these institutions, which are really large, by the way, and it takes a little bit of their allocation to tilt towards a different asset to really make the difference for the price, right? And I think that's what's happening with gold. Uh, you can also see it in the data that foreign institutions are allocating more of their percentage of reserves into gold. And I think that explains part of it. And it also makes sense to me, right? I mean, you have all this foreign surplus of money that needs a home. And what they want, obviously, is a very liquid market, a market they can use to offload the surplus if, you, if they want to rescue their economy, for example, or weaken their currency. And the candidate is treasuries. They're very liquid. You can sell them, you can repo them. The second best candidate when it comes to market liquidity, but the first best candidate when it comes to the uh, transparency and non-politically driven side of that market is obviously gold. And so you're getting you know, more allocation there and it makes sense. And that is, I think, supporting the gold price despite uh, real yields being higher. So you should see the, the real yields theory works because real yields, uh, sorry, gold is seen as an alternative to money so another form of money that isn't dollars but is gold but gold doesn't bear coupons so gold doesn't pay you in other words to own it with coupons so when real yields go down gold as an alternative form of money becomes more attractive and vice versa and this relationship is now breaking because people are looking at the property of gold as an alternative form of money which are not related to how other assets are doing, but they're related to other structural problems like the US sanctioning foreign exchange reserves. And so the elasticity of how people find gold attractive is not related anymore to whether real yields are one or zero or minus one. It's related to, can I use these dollars as a foreign country? Can I use this money really? Well, maybe not. So I don't care whether the real yields are gonna be one, zero or two. I want to be able to deploy my hard earned surplus and therefore I allocate more to gold. That's the explanation I can give. Uh, it's more about sovereignty and I would also claim without going to the semantics that gold might be the only type of actual real money still in the system. That is true because it, it's not politically driven, it's not sanctionable uh, and I mean it is but not a, at a global level uh, from that perspective. It sits already on the balance sheet of all institutions in the world and obviously when you get an example where 
you know, you want to care whether your money is getting real yields of plus one, zero, or minus one. The problem is whether you can use your money in the first place. Mm -hmm. Then gold becomes a more viable alternative, at least to allocate a, a higher proportion of your surplus to gold rather than to dollars. Yet it's weird enough that the BIS doesn't see it as a high quality liquid asset. Yes. Uh, well, that's another funny story. The BIS is a, a body of regulators at the end of the day. You can think of them as the central bank of the central banks, pretty much. And you always need to ask yourself, uh, what is the incentive scheme? Okay, That's a question you should always ask yourself in life, but especially in markets. The regulators have made treasuries and bonds a, a zero uh, risk weight asset, 0%, which means you don't need to attach any capital to your purchase. As a bank, you can buy as many treasuries, as many common bonds as you want, attaching zero capital to your purchase. So you don't, you assume they will never default, they will never take a drawdown, nothing. Who has decided that? Regulators, that it's, those are self-made rules at the end of the day, right? The same regulators have decided that gold doesn't qualify as a, as a level one asset. I think it's a bit on purpose. I mean, mm. banks have very large balance sheets. And if you would tell them, hey, regulation allows you to go and buy gold, they obviously will think the same way that the Brazilian central bank. I don't have a good explanation, Alex, of why gold wouldn't be an HQLA one asset. I mean, uh, they even have HQLA uh, two assets. They have uh, corporate bonds and mortgage-backed securities and equities. I mean, come on, give me a break. But I think there is a reason. If you tell banks, hey, uh, guys, you can go and buy level one asset as gold, they will buy it, right? Just also to diversify their portfolio. And, and they will have gold prices going much higher because a new whaling town comes and uh, they can lose control of the whole thing at the end of the day, right? Uh, this is the reason. And it sounds like conspiracy theory, but banks balance sheet around the world are fucking gigantic. My calculation is that the uh, HQLA buffers of European and US banks is north of $10 trillion. Think if they say you can buy gold and everybody allocates just 10%. 5% to gold, that's $500 billion. <laughs> I mean, what's going to happen to gold prices? Yeah. They, they will go up and, and it's a very price inelastic buyer. Mm -hmm. People will buy gold at 2,000, 2,500, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you cannot value gold. I mean, it's, it's, it's an alternative form of money. And it can go to 3,000 and, and then medias are going to be all over it. And the households are going to be like, holy fuck, what's happening? I need some gold as well. It's, it can escalate very much. Mm -hmm. That's it. it. It's a threat to the system as a whole. And um, if you also think about also like the way um, gold has been also maybe suppressed and there's like all kinds of theories and speculation about the way um, gold prices have been manipulated um, through ETFs, it also begs to think about uh, what's going to happen to Bitcoin. Maybe a couple of ETFs uh, from which um, yeah, big investment uh, funds or institutions like BlackRock are pushing. What, what do you think, how is it going to play out uh, for Bitcoin? For Bitcoin is a, it's a much more volatile asset to start with and uh, institutional investors don't like volatility. Uh, so that's a bit of a deterrent for the time being. It's been around for way less than gold. It doesn't sit on the balance sheet of all institutions in the world. So it basically starts from a, a much weaker starting point. It's, an, it's a newer, the new kid in town, basically, okay, for this kind of role in the monetary system. So uh, I think it's a long way until Bitcoin can claim this kind of role. Uh, in principle, the conditions are potentially there, but it's a, it's a very early stage process because gold is, not, is, is already ingrained in our financial system as an asset and Bitcoin isn't. So I think the potential, uh, if the, the real reason why gold is not an HQ, HQLA asset while corporate bonds are, mortgage-backed securities are, is that if it was, it wouldn't be the worst thought in the world from all banks to say, well, we're going to allocate 5% of our buffer to gold, but that becomes a lot of money flowing to the gold market all at once, and, and that can be very destabilizing. A funny story for you, uh, I worked for a European bank for, uh, yeah, eight, for eight years, yeah. and I had the chance to talk to many other treasurers at other European banks, French and German, et cetera. And uh, in 2019, interest rates were negative. So as a bank, you were getting deposits in from clients and uh, you couldn't charge them negative interest rates. So uh, you, were paid, you were paying 0% to your clients, but you were depositing the money at the central bank 
at the European Central Bank at minus 0.5. In other words, you were losing money on deposits coming in. So at some point, a bank started wondering, uh, can we buy some gold? You know, at least we are not going to lose money, nominally speaking, straight away on gold. And they were thinking about allocating 5% of it. I was even assigned to the task of looking into it. And then I said, well, guys, uh, we're going to get a penalty on our liquidity because it's not an HQLA1 asset. <laughs> They said, what? Yeah, look at the rules. It's not in there. But you can see what happens. People start thinking about it, but then they look at their incentive scheme. As a bank, there is regulation. Regulation says, not worth it. You know, you're going to get penalized by doing that. And so I think this is really the reason why uh, gold doesn't qualify. I can't, I, I can't see any other real reason, if not that, uh, making gold an HQLA1 asset can lead to a lot of flows into gold, reasonable flows, asset allocation flows into gold, which can make the price pretty explosive, which can generate a cascade of attention from media and more flows. You know, it becomes a page one of the newspaper story. And in a fiat system, you don't want that, I would say. I think we're, we're uh, uh, coming uh, to an end uh, because you told me, right, like... Uh... We're, we're approaching now. We're, we're just past the one hour uh, threshold. Um, let's let's maybe um, hear from you a few words about uh, the course that you've uh, uh, crafted uh, from all that experience. And now you've given us a sneak peek uh, through that conversation. But uh, you have a course which is much more structured and has really lots of more insights about yeah. the craft of <laughs> uh, bond uh, trading. So guys, the, the idea is the following. The bond, bond market is really important to understand, yet it scares people away. It sounds complicated. And my job is to make it easy for you guys to understand. And this is what the bond market course that I created is all about. Now, um, it's four hours of material, video material, slides you can download, sources you can follow to keep track of what, what the bond market is signaling. If you buy it, you can watch it at whatever time. So you don't need to watch it immediately. You can always have access to it. But there is one thing you can't wait for, which is the discount I'm about to give. That is only for the first 50 buyers that will use the discount code GOLD. It's a pretty nice discount code. So if you go on the website where I think we're going to put a link yeah. somewhere, Alexei, um, if you go on the, on the website indicated here, you go in there, you buy the course, you put the code GOLD, you'll get 20% off. Only if you are within the first 50 people of doing that, please take advantage of the offer. Thanks a lot, Alf. Uh, you're also on Twitter, obviously, uh, sharing always those insights. You have your newsletter uh, that people can subscribe and also um, yeah, follow. Uh, you have, I think, more than, what, 150,000 subscribers on the yeah. newsletter? 150,000 on the newsletter and a lot more on Twitter. Maybe it's because of the pizza pictures that I post from time to time. <laughs> I think those are more interesting than, uh, than the macro. Um, thanks a lot and uh, I hope to uh, talk to you soon and uh, as Alf said there's a link down below in the description thanks Alexei talk soon thanks for watching if you liked this episode give it a like and don't forget to subscribe leave your actions down below in the comment section and if you want to watch more videos feel free to check the most recent video but also any other video that we've had published on the channel before see you next time